session that a lot of you are waiting for. Uh, Raskin Bond with G. Thail talking to Sandeep Roy. Thank you for your patience and uh, the other great debt of thanks that we owe is to Tata Steel who have been our title sponsor this year and with all our other sponsors they are the people who make this festival you know possible because it's a huge logistical task and their unquestioning support to us and their patience is something we value so I'd like you all to give a round of applause to all our sponsors. I'd now like to welcome Mr. Narendran, the Managing Director of Tata Steel, to present this session by inviting the, the speakers. Over to you, Mr. Narendran. Good evening. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you to this session with the legendary Mr. Ruskin Bond and Mr. G. Thail which to my mind is aptly titled, Lovely, Dark and Deep. Tata Steel is privileged to be the title sponsor of the Kolkata Literary Meet 2015. We've always supported and partnered with organizations and initiatives that aim to foster and encourage intellectual and cultural pursuits in society. We are committed to deepening our engagement with civil society and cultural moorings of this region as we move ahead. In fact, uh, this was the driving force behind coming here and supporting this in Kolkata because we have been in the East and we are invested in the East and we want to grow in the East and we certainly want the Eastern region to have its own share of such events. It's now my pleasure to introduce eminent speakers to you. What can one say of Mr. Bond, winner of the Sahitya Academy Award, the Padma Shri and the Padma Bhushan and his first no novel was published when he was just 21. Since then he has written more than 300 short stories, essays and novels including Vagrants in the Valley, The Blue Umbrella, Funny Side Up, and A Flight of Pigeons. He has also written more than 30 books for children. Most of his work has been influenced by his life in the hill stations at the foothills of the Himalayas, where he spent his childhood. His book, Flight of Pigeons, has been adapted into the film Junoon. A Room on the Roof has been adapted into a television serial produced by BBC. And several of his stories have been incorporated in school curriculum in India, including The Night Train at Dioli, Time Stops at Shamli, and Trees Still Grow in Dera. In 2007, a film for children based on his popular novel for children, The Blue Umbrella, won the national award in the best children's film category. The other speaker at this session is Mr. G. Thail, who is best known as a poet, no novelist, and a musician. His first novel, Necropolis, won the DSC Prize for South Asia Literature and was shortlisted for the 2012 Man Booker Prize and the Hindu Literary Prize. His well-known collections include, these errors are correct, English, Apocalypso and Gemini. For these errors are correct, he won the Sahitya Award in the English category. Besides his credentials as a writer, he is also known as a songwriter and a guitarist. And in the early 80s, he was also a guitarist for the psychedelic rock band Atomic Forest. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I hand over the session to Mr. Sandeep Roy, who will take you through an engaging conversation with Mr. Raskin Bond and Mr. G. Thail on ghosts, black widows, black, sorry, black windows, charges, and more. Over to you, Mr. Roy. Thank you, Mr. Narendran. I'd like to invite Jeet, Thayil, and Sandeep Roy. It's also a very special day for Sandeep. Sandeep has been with the Literary Meet for all four editions. He's been very, very obliging, read books in three hours to, monitor, to moderate sessions. And it gives me a very special joy to get his book launched by Mr. Bond and Jeet here. So I just request them to unwrap the books. Thank you. 
The book is Don't Let Him Know and it's available at the bookstore near the East Gate. Over to you, Sandeep. All right. Well, thank you very much, both of you. It's very special to have the book launched here like this at the Kolkata Literary Meet. And, uh, but to get on with what we really want to talk about, which is ghosts. My book doesn't have a ghost, unfortunately, so I can't tie it into, into this conversation. But uh, I thought it was a little um, daring, I guess, of us to decide to have a conversation about ghosts while sitting here in the Victoria Memorial after dark with, uh, you know, it's like sort of tempting fate, but we will be brave and with bright lights go ahead with it. But I thought maybe to set the mood for it, we could hear a little bit of one of uh, Ruskin Bond's most famous ghost stories. And uh, it was in fact one that was one of the first ones I encountered. Uh, and I remember being reading it twice because it, it was quite, it was kind of one of those pleasurable chills that you get and so you read it. But I thought for, it'll be kind of interesting to actually have Jeet read the story and for Ruskin Bond to actually listen to his story. So, Jeet. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here with Mr. Ruskin Bond and uh, of course to be uh, to help launch Shandeep's book. Uh, uh, I'm going to read a story called A Face in the Dark. And the amazing thing about this story is its brevity. It's a, a, a marvel of economy. It's only um, a little over two pages. But I think it's pretty guaranteed to give you a little shiver at the end. Here is A Face in the Dark. Mr. Oliver, an Anglo-Indian teacher, was returning to his school late one night on the outskirts of the hill station of Shimla. From before Kipling's time, the school had been run on English public school lines, and the boys, most of them from wealthy Indian families, wore blazers, caps, and ties. Life magazine, in a feature on India, had once called it the Eton of the East. Mr. Oliver had been teaching in the school for several years. The Shimla Bazaar with its cinemas and restaurants was about three miles from the school and Mr. Oliver, a bachelor, usually strolled into the town in the evening, returning after dark when he would take a shortcut through the pine forest. When there was a strong wind, the pine trees made sad, eerie sounds that kept most people to the main road. But Mr. Oliver was not a nervous or imaginative man. He carried a torch, and its gleam, the batteries were running down, moved fitfully down the narrow forest path. When its flickering light fell on the figure of a boy who was sitting alone on a rock, Mr. Oliver stopped. Boys were not supposed to be out after dark. What are you doing out here, boy? asked Mr. Oliver sharply, moving closer so that he could recognize the miscreant. But even as he approached the boy, Mr. Oliver sensed that something was wrong. The boy appeared to be crying. His head hung down. He held his face in his hands and his body shook convulsively. It was a strange, soundless weeping and Mr. Oliver felt distinctly uneasy. Well, what's the matter, he asked, his anger giving way to concern. What are you crying for? The boy would not answer or look up. His body continued to be racked with silent sobbing. Come on, boy, you shouldn't be out here at this hour. Tell me the trouble. Look up. The boy looked up. 
He took his hands from his face and looked up at his teacher. The light from Mr. Oliver's torch fell on the boy's face, if you could call it a face. It had no eyes, ears, nose or mouth. It was just a round, smooth head with a school cap on top of it. And that's where the story should end. But for Mr. Oliver, it did not end here. The torch fell from his trembling hand. He turned and scrambled down the path, running blindly through the trees and calling for help. He was still running towards the school buildings when he saw lanterns swinging in the middle of the path. Mr. Oliver stumbled up to the watchman, gasping for breath. What is it, Sahib? asked the watchman. Has there been an accident? Why are you running? I saw something, something horrible, a boy weeping in the forest, and he had no face. No face, Sahib? No eyes, no nose, mouth, nothing. Do you mean it was like this, Sahib? asked the watchman and raised the lamp to his own face. The watchman had no eyes, no ears, no features at all, not even an eyebrow, and that's when the wind blew the lamp out. Uh, thank you, Jit. Uh, it, it sounds much better when you read it. <laughs> <laughs> Very kind of you to say that. Um, and, uh, that, and after the lamp was blown out, there was one more line which somehow my publishers left out. It just said, and that's when Mr. Oliver had his heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's clear that something like that, that is coming. Cool. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's probably yes, yes, perhaps it was best left Best out. to yeah. imagine what would m happen to Mr. Oliver, whether it's a heart yes. attack or... Uh, yes. But... Uh, Mr. Bond, when is there a story behind this story? Um, not, not really. Uh, the, I, I, um, I did go to school in Simla, of course, hmm? and they say hill, hill stations um, are supposed to have ghosts, and um, I think mostly British ghosts. Hmm? <laughs> they just couldn't leave. <laughs> no, no, they wouldn't go away. <laughs> the, the the real people left. They left their ghosts behind. But um, and whereas in the in the plains of India, you have a large variety of spooks. You know, bhuts and prates and things like that, and called uh, very mischievous ones who live in people trees and jump down your throat if you leave your mouth wide open or yawn. So, so um, particularly in rural areas, I think, I don't know about Calcutta, must have its ghosts. And um, right now, who knows, Queen Victoria might be roaming around in the back, at the back over there, just watching over this monument. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, ghosts are sort of um, um, around us, even if we don't always see them or, or are aware of them. <clears throat> W were you, uh, as a child growing up, were you kind of a scared child? Did you, did you think about ghosts much? Um, I was, <clears throat> no, I didn't really. I think it was only <clears throat> the first book of ghost stories that I read mm, that, um, that really made me sort of uh, conscious of ghosts and spirits. And that was a book of stories by M.R. James. Now, he was a... He was the guru of all ghost story writers back in the 1860s or 70s. He was, a, he was an academic and taught in a university in England. And a lot of his stories have an academic background, but they're very effective. And the, he wrote just two books of stories, the ghost stories of an antiquity and um, a warning to the curious. Hmm? Um, and after reading that, when I was about 10, 11, um, I was always looking out for good ghost stories. What about looking out for good ghosts? Um, to, to tell you the truth, in spite of... I'm not really a ghost hunter or a ghost buster. Um, I, I, um, they, I don't go looking for them. But they do come looking for me sometimes. <laughs> uh, and and the, the most prevalent one is the, the lady who tucks me up late at night. Sometimes I'm 
I don't sleep too well. Um, I have a restless night and the, the, the blanket or the rizai slips off my bed. And I'm conscious of someone picking it up, putting it back on top of me, tucking me in. And when I put the light on, there's nobody there. Hmm? So it's, uh, I, I've always thought of it as a motherly ghost. But, but just the other day, somebody said it might be a fatherly ghost. <laughs> um, but there's always a sort of perfume in the air, which makes me think it's, it's a lady. Hmm? It could be a man too. Some I men are... Now we go, men going for perfumes, perfumes too, too, so too. you never know. <laughs> but does, does this only happen at your home in the hills? Or do, does this motherly ghost follow you too, like the Taj Bengal? Is she tucking you into bed? Um, <laughs> and, no, I, well, I'm still there one night. There's one night left, so let's see if, if anybody tucks me into bed tonight. <laughs> what about you, Jeet? Uh, you know, I, I used to think go, ghosts are like cats. They're housebound. You know, it depends on, on the place. But no, I think it's uh, absolutely not true. They do follow you around. Uh, and I'm sure uh, ghosts are uh, living or dead. You know, why wouldn't you want to hang out at the Taj Bengal? But did you, did you, when you were growing up, were you interested in ghosts? Was, was it any part of your fantasy life? Did you see ghosts? Um, I, you know, I, I have to admit that when I, I, I had a very happy childhood and I had no relationship with ghosts at all. Ghosts are not incompatible with happy childhood. With happy childhood. <laughs> well, you know, it, something happened because... Uh, it's, it was only as an adult that I came to believe in ghosts, you know, and now I'm a firm believer in ghosts. I think, uh, I think you'd be a fool not to. The air is populated with, with figures. I notice the, the audience is drifting away quietly, I think, some of them. <laughs> some of them. Am I getting a bit worried? <laughs> <laughs> but, Mr. Bond, you'd also written in a 